what we have here are points of interest. And these are stored at the index at the location server in such a way that the client can retrieve them in an efficient fashion. But there are no users here. All of these are hospitals, if you like. So the points of interest are more like access points from where the user can access I'm sorry? The points of interest are more like access points from where the user can actually access or are there No, uh, are the points that he's looking for. The points he's looking for, the landmarks that he's looking for. The user, the user location there is in red. Only the user knows his location. The server does not know the location of the user. However, the server knows the location of all hospitals. Right? So the user will enter this protocol with the server, whereas the server will send back to the user only the points in the partition of the user, but without knowing where the user is in. Because he uses that protocol that we have seen, which hides the value of the object that I'm looking for. So we have seen how we can do approximate queries. Can we do exact? Yes, but slightly more expensive. How? Again, assume a data space with points of interest. Given this data space, this data space the server will partition um, the, the points according to a Voronoi diagram. And again, this is done offline. What is a Voronoi diagram? A Voronoi diagram is a disjoint partitioning of the space into polygonal regions. And the property of the very useful property of this concept is that within each polygonal region, the points situated in this gray region are closer to P1 than to any other point in the data set. So if I have a query point lying in this region, its actual nearest neighbor will be P1. And similarly for the other partitions. Voronoi diagrams, uh, there is a lot of uh, literature on this and uh, in the spatial databases literature and uh, a lot of papers and it is not difficult to generate. So for, uh, for a data set of, uh, that we have used of uh, maybe 100,000, it takes maybe less than a minute. And this is done offline. This is not done online. For 2D, for two-dimensional data set, Voronoi are very efficient. On top of this, uh, this gen partitioning, we superimpose the regular grid. And this regular grid will correspond to the PIR matrix that we have. However, this time, we'll not have the property that we have one point of interest in each cell. Instead, what we store in each grid cell would be the points whose corresponding Voronoi cell cells intersect that grid cell. So let's take an example here. Cell A3 lies at the intersection of the three Voronoi diagrams corresponding to P1, P2, and P3. So we store all these points. On the other hand, inside A4, there is only the Voronoi diagram of, A, uh, of P1, right, which is included. So we will only store P1. This is repeated for all grid cells. What is the idea? The idea is that if I retrieve the contents of a particular grid cell, I know my nearest neighbor, as long as I lie in, within that grid cell. So at query time, the user, assuming that he's situated in this location, will create this query. Of course, the user knows the granularity of the grid, but this is a very simple uh, protocol to, to this is, there is a, a very simple method to find out. He can simply ask for the granularity of the grid, just like he asked for the root node in the previous example. So once he knows the granularity of the grid, the user knows his cell. He knows his column, and therefore he will ask for the corresponding D column, right? He will get the Z values that result from the protocol. And this time, he will not make use of the redundancy. Why? Because this is an exact protocol. So he only needs Z2. He doesn't need the rest. And we have an optimization in the paper, which I, I will not discuss today, which allows us to change the geometry of the matrix. So if I decrease the number of rows, I have less redundant content, right? Any questions? Uh, in this case, all of them are returned all because of all of them. But what we can do is that we can decrease the number of rows 
and fewer z will be returned to the user. And if you decrease the number of rows, wouldn't the server know the rows were Yes, but as long as all the, no, actually all the, all the numbers will be, uh, if there is one single row, then the server will know that it's in that row, but all the data elements will be there as well. So from the server's point of view, he processes all the cells. So he doesn't know in which row the data lies in. So we have seen the protocols. Uh, now, we have also seen that each query processing involves a large number of multiplications with large numbers. Okay? A large amount of multiplications with large numbers. And the problem is that this can be costly. So previous to our work, there were concerns that this method is not applicable in practice because it's too expensive. And actually, there was a paper which said that why don't we just download the entire database? Because at some point, we might end up cheaper. The idea is that if you are a service provider, you're not likely that you're going to want to surrender your database to a user. You're just going to want to charge the user for, for every access right. So you cannot charge the user for getting the entire database. So again, there is a business model problem. However, we were able to reduce the cost of this PIR protocol, and this is also our contribution. So the PIR protocol per se is not our contribution, the PIR protocol for binary data. However, we do contribute some optimizations, and I will just briefly go through them. First, we have here a sample data matrix. We have seen earlier that we are only interested in those elements which have one values, right? So for Z1, for instance, we will multiply Y3 with Y4, Y5, and Y6. This will be the result, correct? Z2 will be Y1 times Y3 times Y5 times Y6, and so on. Now, if I see that a lot of these patterns are frequent, I can save some multiplications. Why? Because using, for instance, the shaded pattern here, Y3, Y5, Y6, I can determine Z1 by multiplying this with y4, and I can determine z2 by multiplying with y1. So there is a significant saving in terms of multiplications. How can we find these patterns? We can employ a data mining algorithm. Again, this is offline. As long as the data set is static, this can be quite efficient. So in an offline phase, we mine for frequent patterns of ones. Let's assume that we found this, these patterns, for instance, uh, column 2 and 3, okay, which appears three times, and 3, 5, 6, again, three times. Once we identify these frequent products, we can build an execution plan, which is similar to what is happening in databases with indexes, right? So in this execution plan, whenever I want to uh, compute Z1, I'll first check this Y3, Y5, Y6 value. If it is computed already, I use it. If not, I compute it and I cache it, and I will use it later. And we'll see that we can have significant savings. So even if the method is expensive in its original theoretical formulation, which says that you have to multiply n numbers, because basically you have to multiply all the numbers in your matrix, in practice you can save a lot. And finally, uh, I will use the same diagram for the final optimization. So most of you probably already noticed that each row is computed independently, right? So why don't I just use parallelization? And this is an embarrassingly parallel problem. It is very easy to have linear speed up. So what we can do is that we can split horizontally this matrix, and we can send sets of rows, chunks of rows, to different CPUs. Each CPU will compute its share, will determine its Z, and return the Z if you like to a master, if we use a master-slave paradigm. So we can use this master-slave paradigm. In, a ma in an offline phase, the master will scatter the PI matrix in chunks of rows, and then at query time, the, the query is processed in parallel. And we will see again that the, the improvement is almost linear to the number of CPUs. Any questions so far? I'll just have to go through the experiments, and then hopefully I'll be done in time. Okay, for the experiments, we have used both real and synthetic data sets. I will only present 
the results with real 